Welcome to the Filmings Podcast, a road poetry podcast where we analyze all that goes into effective filmmaking. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Alex. And this is episode 142, Kiarostami's Coker and Tehran. Kind of. Yes, because we are doing an interesting uh, kind of overlapping dual set of trilogies here from the uh, one and only director Abbas Kiarostami. This is the only uh, time we can do two trilogies in the span of four movies. Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. It's it works out really well because they're thematic and they're unofficial, which yeah. is is basically the conceit. And Unless the you fans, ask Criterion, Criterion wants it to be official real bad. Well, the Criterion's all about uh, kind of assigning some badge of officiality to to, to movies, and I'm a sucker for it, honestly. But <laughs> that that is kind of like their brand. Um, but yes, we are talking about Abbas Kiarostami. Um, who was born in June on June twenty second, nineteen forty, in Tehran, Iran? Hey, that was um, three we're, days ago. Yeah, like a three days and uh, eighty two years ago. Yeah. Um, and and we're gonna be talking about two of his trilogies. One that is defined by location, a shared location, and is kind of like the fan assumed trilogy, and the other of which, which is defined by theme, and is the. Um, Life is Precious trilogy. The Life is Precious trilogy, for lack of a better term, the one determined by the director himself. Although we should note that the first three, the the location connected movies, are also connected diegetically by being like different l- layers of the same meta cake. And yeah, we'll talk about all that as we get into it. But uh, that's just to kind of set the stage. But talking about Kiro Stami himself, um, as a kid and a teenager, he was originally a painter and majored in art and graphic design at the University of Tehran, and in fact won a few art competitions as a teenager, if I remember correctly. Uh, He worked as a traffic officer to support his studies in college, and I do wonder if those hours of staring at people in cars influences uh, his work and his his people-watching sensibilities when it comes to his cinematic style. In the 60s, he worked in advertising, actually, very Mad Men-like, designing posters and shooting over 150 commercials for TV. That's a quick way to work up your uh, film technology chops, for sure. Yeah. Also started illustrating children's books and designing film credit titles. Uh, Following the emergence of the Iranian New Wave with, uh, oh man, I did not practice this name, Darius, I I think it's Darius, um, like the Persian Emperor, uh, Merjul's film Gav from 1969, Kiarostami helped set up the Institute for Intellectual Development of Children and Young Adults. Uh, and here at this institute, which he kind of ran, uh, he made his first film, The Bread and the Al- the Bread and Alley from 1970, a 12-minute neorealistic short film about a schoolboy's encounter with an angry dog in an alley. Uh, the institute became one of Iran's most successful and awarded film studios, producing other directors' acclaimed films such as The Runner from 1984 and Bashu, The Little Stranger from 1986. In the 70s, he pursued a more individualistic style with the films like The Traveler from 1974 and his first full-length feature, uh, which is astounding to think of that up until this point, he had had this whole film career where he was only making short films. Yeah. Uh, his first feature, Report, from 1977, about a tax collector accused of accepting bribes and contemplating suicide. Another important thing we'll be talking about today. Uh, His first film to garner significant attention internationally was 1987's Where is the Friend's House, uh, which is the first part of the Coker Trilogy, trilogy, and it launched the Coker Trilogy as a whole, so-called because of the common location and the tied meta-narratives and the centrality of the 1990 Manji Rudbar earthquake in northern Iran. But uh, Kiarostami never called them a trilogy himself, preferring to group the later two films with Taste of Cherry from 1997, centering around the theme of the preciousness of human life. Uh, His work in the 90s grew his international recognition, and he started to garner lots of awards, like the Prix Roberto Rossellini, the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival, and the Silver Lion at the Venice Film Festival. And there were others. Trust me, there were others. Uh, In 2000, he won the current Kurosawa Lifetime Achievement Award in San Francisco, but ended up giving it away to a veteran Iranian actor, Beruz uh, Vosugi, 
Throughout the 2000s, his work became more and more experimental, finding more ways to tell narratives, mostly in cars, and comprising longer takes, including, I believe there's a film called Five and another film called Ten. And uh, one of those is like five stills with like a story told over them, and the other one is like ten long shots. So getting really more and more experimental. He kicked off the 2010s with his first film made outside of Iran ever, which is wild to think about too, Certified Copy from 2010, and he passed away on July 4th in uh, 2016 in Paris. His, the last film he ever made was released posthumously in 2017, 24 Frames, an experimental film based on 24 of Kirstami's still photos. Um, so quite the ex, uh, storied and experimental career, uh, that yeah. became quite international in the second half and garnered quite a bit of acclaim. Uh, but we have to talk about those four movies that comprise, comprise two trilogies. So what are those films, Jonathan? Yeah, and just before we get off of the bio, I do want to mention that uh, just because it speaks to his his acclaim, uh, he was invited to join the board of the award show that shall not be named in an effort to make that board more international. Uh, but that was just before he passed away, and he was never actually able to uh, join that um, committee. Uh, but the films of his that we're going to be talking about is Where is the Friend's House from 1987, starring Babak and Ahmed Ahmadpour. Uh, the title comes from a poem by Sorab Sep Separi. I did practice these names, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, you know, the pronunciation isn't actually that hard because it's another like Indo-European language, but like the 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 way like the it's hard to cold the, read. It's almost like the um, like it's not the it's not the letters and it's not the pronunciation of the letters, but just like the order of the letters. Mm -hmm. It like the syllables are just the ordered in like an and unexpected vowels. way. Yeah, yeah, and it's totally pronounceable. We're just not used to looking at it. Yeah. Uh, the second film of the Coker trilogy and the first film of the Precious Life trilogy is And Life Goes On from 1992, also known as Life and Nothing More, starring Farhad Karamand and Buba Bayor. And the third film of the Coker trilogy and the second film of the Life is Precious trilogy, Through the Olive Trees from 1994, starring Hossein Rezai, uh, Farhad Karadmand and Muhammad Ali Keshavars. And finally, the last film of the Life is Precious trilogy, Taste of Cherry from 1997, starring Homayun Ershadi. Yeah, almost exclusively. And that's a pretty important point, actually, that we'll yeah. talk about uh, when we get to the movie. Uh, let's jump into Where is the Friend's House from 1987. Jason, take it away. Where is the Friend's House from 1987? Ahmad and Mohammad Reza are both grade schoolers in Kokar, Iran. Mohammad Reza has gotten in trouble multiple times for forgetting his school notebook. After accidentally taking said notebook, Ahmad sets out on an adventure to the neighboring village to find his friend's house through a confusing adult world. Fun fact, this, uh -huh. is, this is the last film that I watched on Filmstruck. Oh, really? On Filmstruck? Yeah. Back on when Filmstruck. Filmstruck was Filmstruck? Yep. And, uh... Oh. Yeah, I watched it right before it died, and uh, I made a little note in Letterboxd. Um, so, anyway. Yeah, that was sad. That was sad when that happened. Uh, but it it was it looked very um, intriguing and wholesome, and it did not disappoint. And uh, watching it again, it's uh, it's just such a good movie. Like, and I remember um, when we covered uh, Iranian films in the world tour, one of the themes. Um, that we talked about with several of those films is kind of the idea of films without like a bad guy or an antagonist. And I think that still holds true for most of these films that that we're talking about. Yeah, that's very true. If anything, the uh, the struggle in a lot of these movies is based around um, like the struggle to communicate, if anything. Yeah, like that's 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 I feel like that's maybe a, a big central theme is how hard it is to communicate how you actually feel or or these very complicated feelings that we experience. Um, and then like how those feelings drive us to act, which is normally contrary to how society expects us to act um, in varying circumstances. And then that creates pressure. And especially in two of these movies that we're going to be talking about. 
uh, there's a big event that kind of uproots society. So mm-hmm. the question is, you know, how some people cl- will cling to the the society that was shattered by the event, and others will try to forge a new one in its wake. And wh- what's the synthesis between that, the thesis and that antithesis? But in the friend's house, there really isn't an antagonist. There's kind of like an antagonist of certain scenes specifically like the teacher in the opening scene is kind of antagonist the mom will refer to the house as an antagonist and various adults grown-ups in this one it's kind of just all (laughs) grown-ups and so and so the the antagonism if anything comes from the the dissonance that exists between both the between the a child's world and an adult's world so that's really so like when we think about the idea of an antagonist it's just something that is preventing the protagonist from achieving their goal. And so in this case, it's kind of circumstance and just sort of social structure or... Society. um, It's it's, it's one of the basic fundamental um, forms of conflict. And... But more than society, it's it's like... It's it's, uh, kind of the the child's naivety or just kind of... uh, uh, Their worldview, their perception of the world. Or yeah, th- their limitation thereof, like because he comes in, he go, he he's never gone out of his little town by himself, you know. And you can imagine, you can remember times, you know, going on errands by yourself for the first time or something like that, and you're just like, I don't know, like I I generally know how to talk to people, but I've never been this far. I don't know if people are gonna be different. I don't know why some people are mean to me, and you know, it's kind of just this uh, curiosity and. Uh, um, and yeah. mystery of just not knowing. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I, w- I would like to say that I do think there is a bias in um, in, in Western cinema uh, towards one type of conflict that can exist in a story. And if you think back to, like, you know, very early English classes or literature classes um, in, like, middle school and high school, you learned about, like, the different kinds of of uh, of conflict like man versus self, man versus nature, yeah. man versus society, man versus man, and we have a big, 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 big bias towards man versus man right. in um, in Western cinema, especially. Not always. There are or definitely angsty exceptions. Man versus self movies. Yeah, uh, but even in those, there normally has to be like a physical like antagonist, somebody embodying the forces against you. Right. Um, so sometimes it's kind of wild to approach these narratives where there isn't really like a single person against you. It's just that the world outside, for lack of a better word, word society, is intimidating and hard to navigate mm-hmm. and presents the challenge to you. Um, and it, in, normally in man versus society, the, um, the, the antagonism isn't direct, right? It's not like you're ne- you don't necessarily have to be an outlaw. You just have to be someone who isn't supported or comfortable yet in that society yeah. and that's enough for the society to become an antagonist i feel like that's what we like have the here. man like the man who takes his his pencil so he can write something down and then just forgets mm. to give it back to him like not like he was out to yeah. be against him it just kind of ended up being another stumbling block in his path to yeah. get his homework to his friend and they do they do such a good job i should say kier does such a good job of putting us on the kid's level and making us feel what the the kid feels yeah um because when that happened you feel the the frustration and basically like the complete helplessness of the kid where he's like i can't do anything on my own i am basically ignored by adults 24 7 unless they're telling me to do something um and just like the the sheer frustration of that kind of existence um and how yeah you're being taken care of but uh, you know, if you're, you can't actually, he's trying to engage cause he has a fairly mature reason that he's going on this adventure, mm-hmm. but whenever he tries to engage with somebody about it, nobody takes him seriously cause he's a kid and they except accomplish, for the guy at the end, which except is for the guy at the end, our <laughs> hero, uh, who walks really slow. I love that guy. Um, and I didn't even realize that he had like a hump on his back until they brought it up in the second movie. Yeah, me neither. I didn't realize a lot of it, but these movies, these movies do function as like, um, uh, background, like BTSs of each other. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they, they do such a good job with the camera work, uh, in this movie of making you, of putting you on the kids level. Right. Oh my gosh. The, All the, of Karastami's films, like the cinematography is just top notch. Cause that's the thing that stood subjective. out to me about, um, close up is just the way he frames things and something about even his film stock choice just looks so unique from any other film that um yeah it's 
it's the placement of getting on the kid's level, but also just the beauty of the way that he shows things like the famous shot of the of the zagging path up the hill that comes up in all three of the films. Um, mm-hmm. Like, come on, Kirstami, don't tell me that you didn't have all three of these films in mind when you put that shot in every single one of them. <laughs> well, just watching them, you get really familiar with that one little slice of Iran. That little hill, yeah. On the on the on the northern side of those mountains, basically almost in the Caspian Sea, you get really familiar with it over the course of this movie. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I mean, the I think it's the combination of um, of one his extensive extensive like art and advertisement background, where he just has all this technical knowledge. Mm-hmm. So he has a good aesthetic sense and he understands the medium very well. And then two, um, I think I, and you know what? I didn't read like a personal bi- biography of him. I just kind of read like a few like career synopsis. Um, but I think he, this guy's a people or was a people watcher, right? Like I yeah, think, makes sense. I think he, this guy just loved watching people and understood them through that. There's and something all of these about movies. Yeah. The way that he shows like people just doing their every day. And you have to imagine all of these films made in Iran, like none of these people are what we think of as actors. Like they may know, like enjoy acting, but they're not like Hollywood trained. Like they're not doing method acting. Like these are mostly real people who understand the concept of acting and are kind of trying it out, but they're so real in front of the camera. Um, and that's that's part of Karosami knowing how real people are by watching them and then being able to direct real people to just kind of live their lives on camera because cameras are intimidating. If you just like go to a family event and point a camera at your aunt, she's not going to act the same as she normally does. <laughs> no, 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 no. And um, Karosami is is very good at kind of like that. Um, well, we, we should say kind of like basically neo realist style, right? Because. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the camera work is much less formal than in neorealism, which is uh, still has a lot of the same conceits of like you know shot structure that Western cinema does. But um, a lot of Kiarostami's work is uh, is based around like non actors. Like he would just go to an area and just find local people. Yeah, <laughs> and just be like, you're an actor now. Uh, and sometimes like for leads, he would have professionals, and obviously for the bigger his movies got, he'd have more and more professional people, right? But like. Uh, but yeah, he basically had that near realistic style, very of, I, I want to say voyeuristic because it's the art of watching. Um, uh, but it's not voyeuristic in the creepy sense. It's voyeuristic because it's, in the cinematic sense because cinem- cinema itself is an art of looking. Um, yeah. and, and it's still, it's still in a sense. Look. And Karasami has the films that are more like, we're just watching things as they happen that that do tow closer to the line of documentary um like i think 10 does that and i think actually just skimming through the wikipedia page i think he actually got kind of um some flack for recording people without their permission on 10 but in the in these films they are still like staged so it's it's still people portraying things that aren't their real life but it just feels voyeuristic because again he can he's able to show people in as close to their natural state as as he can because he knows them he knows how to interact with them and talk with them and direct them um and where's the friend's house of at least of these first three probably of all four of these is the most like traditionally narrative. This one actually yeah. has an ending. <laughs> yeah, it has, it has, it has a, it does have, you know, and that's one of the other things that I really like about it is that it is basically a traditional adventure narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, like this little boy basically experiences an odyssey, but just scaled down to like the, po- the one of the smallest possible levels. Yeah. Right. He goes off on a journey. He's got a noble quest in mind um, he gets defeated. He basically faces, for lack of a better term, monsters um, and adversaries along his way. Uh, he pursues it. He gets so close and he fails, but he just just barely manages to make it work at the last possible second. <laughs> he overcomes second. it by the pureness of his heart. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. And he gets it. He uh, gets it taken care of and his friend is safe on the other side. Yeah. Spoilers, I guess. Sorry. Who is apparently he- his brother, I guess. Because he's his cousin in the film, but is he his brother in real life? Or well, was that what, kind of like how it was portrayed in um, uh, Through the Olive Trees? 
Well, starring Babak and Ahmed Ahmedpour. So oh, I'm yeah, yeah, I even wrote brothers. that. Yeah, <laughs> I should have. I should have probably realized that, yeah. And then mm. we do see them in Through the Olive Trees, and they're standing next to each other. And I think they actually, like, switched their names for Where's the Friend's House, because I'm pretty sure Ahmed is the one that we're following. Uh, I don't know. It's very confusing. But, yeah, I think the two boys who are supposed to be friends, I think the cousins were two of the other boys. The one who came in late was cousins with one of the other boys. But I think these two that are just friends. They are friends in the movie are brothers, are brothers. in real life. Yeah, that would it's make very sense. confusing. But this is how this is how Karostami rolls. He's like, we're going to take real life and we're going to just use it how we can to tell the story in the best way possible, which is really the point of the next two movies. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a very fun exploration. Is it maybe. You know what else it reminds me of? It reminds me a little bit of like a travelogue. Kind and of. It's gonna, we're yeah. going gonna to get way into that territory in just a second when we jump to the next movie. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, too, the other the other film that it reminded me of, and not just because they're both Iranian, but I think it's it's kind of interesting that they are both Iranian, uh, which is Children of Heaven. Which oh, with was, the shoes. Yeah, the little boy and girl who end up having to share one pair of shoes, and he has to get her shoes that were borrowed and never returned, and then he has to get his own shoes so he can run the race. Oh no! He, oh yeah, he gets the shoe. He wins the race on his old shoes to win her new shoes. Anyway, uh, but it was like the same thing. It was just kids trying to solve problems on their own that adults weren't going to help them, but not because what they were trying to do was something their parents didn't want them to do. They just weren't paying attention. Not because anyone was against them. Just like no one was paying attention to them. Exactly. The um, it's almost like being like a, a pseudo non-member of society. Is kind of the viewpoint that I get of uh, being a kid in Iran in the sev- in the seventies and eighties from these movies is like mm-hmm. you're you're basically you're protected, you're taken care of, but you're not considered a full participant in society until you're yeah. like old enough, until you can have a job or something. Well, that was mm-hmm. the other that was the other sad thing was the kid whose back hurt because he's always carrying stuff. Um, and oh gosh, we have we got to bring that up in and life goes on too because that comes to a really. It comes up again in a really interesting way. Where's the friend's house? Or uh, and life goes on is is really fascinating in its meta narrative. Um, but yeah, so you you have the boys who have to work all day when they come home and then aren't able to finish their homework and then they get berated by the teacher. Um, and uh, so yeah, it's it's like every level of what they have to do. They're being told because Ahmed is being told. You know, you can't go play or do anything till you get your homework done. Meanwhile, his classmates are being told that they have to get all their chores done before they can do their homework. And then they're exhausted. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you get you get all the all the feels and you're just put you're just like with the children and uh, just feeling all of it that the other adults are not paying attention to. Yeah, yeah, no, it's um, it's kind of sad. And uh I, I I do kind of hate the idea of homework. I mean, I, I, it's been so long since I've been in school, but I really don't like the idea of homework. Like, what is it supposed to do? I don't <laughs> understand. I don't understand. And also, you spend eight hours a day in school, and you're supposed to go home and spend more hours at home yeah. doing homework. Oh man, dude! And it's it's not it's free instructional time, so it's basically just practice of a sorts, right? So it's not like. It's not it's not valuable from an instructional standpoint. And when it comes to locations like this where kids are both working and schooling, like it's just it's just completely unfair. But that's yeah. neither here nor there. That's but not, apparently that's not the it's a background. pretty universal lament. So yes. we have that yeah. at least. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Kirostami actually made a whole film called Homework. So he did. He he understands the struggle. It. Yeah, I didn't get to that one either, but he understands the struggle of homework as the universal enemy of children. Oh, yeah, everywhere. But alas, shall we move on to And Life Goes On from 1992? Let's do it. Jason, take it away. And Life Goes On from 1992. After the 1990 earthquake that killed 30,000 people in northern Iran, a film director sets out with his son to find the boys who acted in his film shot there. Where is the friend's house? 
On the road, the director encounters the many people still living in the aftermath of the disaster. Oh boy, Alex. This movie is so interesting in the way that it's a meta narrative, but also in the way that it's almost is almost more critical of Karostami himself. Um and maybe film in general, because the the thing that stood out to me the most about this film is how cold the director is like. And that's kind of his journey. But you get this sense that, you know, he's being very polite to everybody, but he's mm-hmm. really not paying attention to the struggles that are very clear in front of him everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you know what it is? It's it's again, it's a, a self like you said, it's a self insert of of. um of Kirostami, right? Because essentially the director in this movie is a role that he actually occupied. It's the director of Where's My, the Friend's House, who mm-hmm. was Kirostami, but now it's someone else. And he does that another time in Through the Olive Trees. Yeah. Um, and in this one, he's more passive, and Through the Olive Trees, he's a little more active. But in this case, we really do see the director as the watcher, as the looker, as the, the, uh, the voyeur, so to speak. And it is interesting to me that the motivation here is uh, of the um, director going to see if the those two kids are okay, because I think it literally means he just wants to see, like literally just see if the kids are okay. I don't know if he really needs to talk to them even. I think he just needs to go see them. And uh, mm-hmm. when the director does talk to uh, the villagers, he's he's curious, but he's curious mostly from like this artistic, like almost like, intellectual standpoint more Almost than he opportunistic is. standpoint like yeah could i yeah, turn it's, this it's, into a story that's very much what it feels like he's very curious about what the story is um he's always asking some, them for favors like <laughs> yeah kind can of we have some water oh you're using this to survive and drink out of i just need to cool my car engine off it's it it's it becomes almost uncomfortable to watch him at some points because he's like he's doing it in a very like societally polite way but also in a just super low-key and sensitive way well it's the it's the it's the paradox of being a um of being a storyteller i think and this goes all the way back to like i mean i i I don't know i don't have anything very active of it but i'm assuming like you know older bards like shakespeare or like even the grim brothers who kind of collect and retell stories um there is because you read those stories and you see all this empathy there and then you realize that a lot of it comes from just watching the the challenges that other people face Mm -hmm. um and and watching the challenges of the world around you and experiencing it through that and then finding a way to bottle that and repackage it into a story it's an interesting it's it's a little bit different though when you have the actual people who are struggling in that bottle like if you're if you're Shakespeare or Poe or someone, you're going to go back to your, you know, hut and you're going to write, write it down. But here, Kiarostami is like essentially making them work for him. Kind of. Yeah. And, and, uh, I don't know if I know in through the olive trees, it's very heavily connected, but in, and, and life goes on. I don't know if he hires a lot of the same people. Uh, from Where's the Friend's House? I think we maybe get a glimpse of a few of the kids. We get the boy uh, whose back hurts. And this is something that I want to bring up because in because that's how they call him out. The son of the director, who I think is literally just there to provide dialogue. Um, and he's like, look, that's that's the boy whose back hurt. And then again, the director goes up to him and kind of has this uh, curiosity of how he survived, how he's doing. And then the boy is carrying this huge pick that is too heavy for him and he lets his son stay with him and his son runs off with his you know jacket and the other boys carrying this pick and still like basically doing the exact same thing he was doing in where is the friend's house just and the director's just kind of watching him you know do the thing that you assume in where is the friend's house the director was showing empathy for the boy whose back was hurting and then in and life goes on you see that the director was just interested in it. He wasn't really interested in doing anything about it, or maybe he just wants the audience to do something about it. It's it, but it brings up all those questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's the point. Um, and I do find it interesting that, uh, in a way, as uh, there is almost always some sort of self insert from Kirstami into his pictures, um, but 
in a way they're 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 personal and I, i'm trying to say they're personal but also in a way that's additional to that so that's not the only way that they're personal um mm-hmm. in, in that they are kind of that voyeuristic sense they are kind of the exploration of his own reaction to these narratives um it's 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 quite fascinating honestly just to see like the the boldness in taking that metal level and, and essentially in, in in a post like earthquake reaction situation yeah. to it too so part of me wonders how much of this is like legitimately just like uh kirostami processing the idea that this place where he just spent so much time during the um the production of where is the friend's house was completely uh devastated by this by this earthquake and processing that and all these people he met and that this is maybe his his cinematic way of addressing those complicated emotions through his his work and his art. So that is interesting. And I have kind of two two thoughts along those lines. One is that in the only extra one of his films that I watched this this month was a certified copy, which deals with a lot of questions of art and relationships and stuff. But in certified copy, there's an author who wrote this book about, you know, uh, whether or not a copy of a piece of art has any value in itself or if it's only has value in relation to the original. But he basically says at some point, I wrote the book to process my own thoughts on the issue because I hadn't even convinced myself of what I was writing. And so you kind of get the sense that Kiarostami is doing that with almost every one of his films. He's processing his own thought process just by making his art. Um, and, And also in terms of the processing the real event in real time, it reminds me a lot of uh, like Rossellini working in Italy, making films during World War II, like as the issues are happening and creating very present and real uh, fictional narratives, but fictional narratives set in a real historical time frame. Yeah, yeah, in a way, yeah. We for- Sometimes we forget how immediate this art is to the people who are making it. Yeah. You know? It's... Um, you get a different kind of voice when you're when you're making art in that kind of situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we should also talk about like some other stuff um, about this movie too. Even though the the uh, the framing situation that is being made it is fascinating. Um, this does have a meta narrative to it, which we've been discussing. Uh, but there is kind of like this instead of like the structure of having like a young kids odyssey, we still have an odyssey of sorts, although without so much of an ending. There's a bit of an ending. Um, but I really like not, the ending. Yeah, I, I like the ending too, but it's more of like the ending is a continuation more than anything else. Like the question is, is he going to turn back? And he doesn't, uh, but we don't necessarily hit our goal. He just continues on his adventure. Um, There's a, but the yeah. structures, but that, that, yeah, that's its own thing. We'll yeah. get to that. In a second. It's, it's, it's an, it's an odyssey, but without a distinct ending. So it's more of like a tra- travelogue and a lot of ways, kind of like a pseudo documentary, even though it's a staged version of a real reality um because after all the director went back to the area to look for these boys to make this movie about the director going back to the area to make to find these boys um and i guess well okay i guess as long as we're here i what i want to kind of bring up about the ending is the fact that he that we don't see him find the boys changes your idea of what the film is about because almost mm-hmm. immediately when the credits started rolling and I realized we're not going to see him find the boys, I had this thought of, oh, this film is not about the boys, you know, because essentially it raises the question, what is so important about those two boys that gives that makes them more important to find than any of these other people? Even the two boys he finds who are, you know, match the description that he thinks are the ones that he's looking for, like. Why are the ones that were in his movie more worthy of finding than those two boys? You know, why is he, you know, looking past all these people to find these two other people when everyone that he's run into has the same, you know, intrinsic value? And I think that's kind of what we get in that last shot where uh, he passes the guy who asks him for a ride and he ignores him. And then the guy helps push his car up the hill and then he passes him again and then he backs mm-hmm. up and finally lets the guy in the car and then you realize yeah, right? he gets it 
like he finally got it. Like I think that last shot, it yeah. goes on. That one shot goes on for probably five or six minutes, and it's well, genius. Kiarostami is a, a. I don't know if we mentioned this in the previous one, but it should be said that he is a lover of the long take. Yeah, um, he he loves to keep that camera rolling as long as possible, and I think for him that's probably because he likes those uh, those moments, those gaps between. Uh, you know, what a more cutty movie might see. So the, the spaces between, I think, is where you find significance. A look, a glance, uh, the hesitation of a car on the road, or the, the fact that it, it takes a while before it backs up um, are expressive to him because he's such a world watcher, such a people watcher. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do like the idea of the, the, the idea that this story is about a guy who goes looking for one thing and then he finds something else and i think that's one of the significant uh pieces uh, what the significant part about having the boy there um because even from the get-go w- uh, one of the first things that happens in the movie is that the boy finds you're talking a about the son. the director's the, the son, son. Yeah, yeah the son uh the the son finds a grasshopper and wants to keep it with him in the car and the director's like no we don't know that basically we don't know that grasshopper kick it out um <laughs> right. Uh, we, so yeah, he, he I forgot there's the so many, so many subtle lines like that at the very beginning. There's th- That's a recurring thing that happens over the course of the mm-hmm. movie, too, is that he runs into somebody. He runs into the old man who's carrying the toilet, uh, yeah. but he knows him, so he gives him a ride. And then, like you said, there's the guy at the end who's carrying something, so he doesn't give him a ride. Because uh, he doesn't know him. Because he doesn't know him, but then he does. Um, and I, I like the idea that the father is going on this, this trip, and he is looking for disaster. He's looking for the kids, right? But he's he's kind of expecting the worst and he's basically looking for the worst. And like you said earlier, he's mining these people for for the story, for the yeah. drama in a certain Sensationalism. respect. So he's he's looking for the drama and the trauma. That's what he's basically been trained to look at as a storyteller is to look for the conflict so that he can Every tell story about Every person he talks it. to, he says, how did you survive? Uh-huh. You know, that's, that's his one question is, how, tell me how did you survive? Obviously, this is not him trying to figure out, yeah. you know, tips or on asking, how to survive an earthquake. This is him looking for his next yeah. film script. Or asking how many people survived or how many people mm-hmm. they know who've died or like really intense questions kind of. Um, meanwhile, the, the, his son, the boy, is busy focused on the life around him. Probably because yeah. he just doesn't know any better, but that's like the power of youthful innocence that we saw in the friend's house. Um where he's he's out looking for the grasshopper. He's out looking. He goes and finds the water well, like a still functional. Mm-hmm. Uh, he finds the, like a functioning piece of infrastructure that's providing life to the people around while the father's back, like just staring at disaster. Yeah. Um, he goes out. He's the one to f- catch a glimpse of the, the first boy that they spot from the movie, I mm-hmm. believe. Um so and he even gets stays behind to watch the soccer game. His obsession with the soccer game uh, throughout the film as well is all about that theme of life goes on. You yeah. came here expecting disaster, and sure there is disaster, but even in the immediate aftermath of the disaster, you'll find these people still living their life and life still going on despite the trauma that happened. Um, mm-hmm. That's and, what the guy oh, says when he's he he meets the guy setting up the antenna to get the soccer game going. And the guy uh-huh. says, yeah, I lost, I lost family too, but you know, life has to keep going. Yeah. And if anything, they need that soccer game right now more than anything else. Right. Um, the, uh, and if, if, if there is like a story more than a, there, there's a plot sort of, um, there's a series of events, uh, but if there's a story, it's this change in the view of the, uh, of the director that we see yeah. over the course of the movie where he's gone to find with this kind of like very dark, almost dramatic outlook. And he, he leaves with a much more optimistic one of like, yeah, these people are, are still alive. They're still living. They're still going. Um, they've continued on. Um, and that kind of makes sense that there's kind of like a focus on that kind of like willingness to continue based on some of the body of work that we've seen from, um, Kirostami overall, that there's a focus on that kind of theme. So one interesting thing about, this film too is I think there's only one true fourth wall break in this film. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, actually. Okay. So the, the idea is that this, this is about 
they don't actually really say that this is the director of Where's the Friend's House. They they kind of imply it. Um, but there's one true fourth wall break when they meet or when they take the guy uh, with the toilet who played um, the old man in Where's the Friend's House. They take him back to his home and the director says, oh, I thought you lived here where the blue door is. And he said, oh, no, that's just where they put my house for the movie because it looked better. My house is over here. And then yeah. off screen, while the director is walking around, you hear the old man talking and he says, that's not my real house either. My house got destroyed in the earthquake. Um, and he had said something a second ago about, you know, thankfully my house was spared. But then you hear in his in his audio, you know, that's not actually my real house either. Like he's talking to the boy. My house was destroyed in the earthquake. And so that's the I think the only time that we're actually brought into the real world. Like you, I can imagine that audio came from like behind the scenes, like the guy was still mic'd up. He's just talking to the boy and Karostami left it in there because it brings everything back. Because as we see in the next film um, and as Karostami likes to remind people, you're always seeing through this tiny veneer of lies like the director in the film is not Kiarostami. He doesn't even necessarily represent the way that Kiarostami is seeing the world. He's representing a way that Kiarostami wants us to be aware of ourselves when we're looking at disasters like this and like a warning, like, I hope that I'm not like this director, but I'm putting myself in his shoes as kind of a warning for myself and for other people, uh, specifically artists. Um, but there's that one moment where he lets the wall down and, and lets that one piece of information kind of slip through, which may itself be fake. I don't know, but it's, it's the only true fourth wall break, I think. Yeah. 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 I don't think I caught that when I first watched it. Yeah. It's, it's pretty subtle, but I, it, it kind of struck me as like, oh my gosh, they just went one extra layer back, uh, in this throughout the whole thing. Um, so yeah, this, this film has so much packed into it. Yeah. What do they call that? Cokerception? Yeah. Coker. Yeah. That does not roll off the tongue. Not really. <laughs> All right. Shall we go deeper and get into through the olive trees from 1994? Yeah. Let's go through the olive trees. Jason, take it away. Through the olive trees from 1994. During the filming of And Life Goes On, two locals are recruited to play a married couple in the film. A student named Tahere, who was left orphaned and homeless by the earthquake, and a stonemason named Hossein, who didn't have a home beforehand. Hossein, also illiterate, is in love with Tahere, but his proposal has been rejected by Tahere's grandmother due to his low social status. While the film is being shot, Hossein tries to get an answer directly from Tahere while being mentioned by the film's director. So this film starts off with the fourth wall break where we see the director of this film. Well, we see. Yeah. OK, so we see the man in the first we shot. Got lots of directors right now. And he stares at the camera and he says, hello, I am the actor playing the director. And so right off the bat, there's our fourth wall break. And we know that we're watching a movie about making a movie where we're watching a fake director direct the fake director from the last movie. But. We also know that Karostami is still behind the camera, uh, and this is not actually him in any of these scenarios. But it's so interesting that he chooses to associate himself with these two fake directors because this guy is much more down to earth and much more empathetic with his actors and with the people around him than the director in And Life Goes On. Yeah, well, it's interesting because the guy in Life Goes On is is a director in the sense that it makes it forms a connection between him and the and certain people and the he's narrative. He's almost an archetype of a director. He's like but he he's, like represents directors. Yeah, like he doesn't really. Um, oh gosh, what am I trying to say? He doesn't really function as a director in the movie. Besides, like the the way he watches, right? But in mm -hmm. in Through the Olive Trees, very actively very evidently uh our this director is a director doing directing stuff right. right like actually directing a scene we spend a long time there's a good chunk of this movie maybe 25 percent of this movie that's spent on multiple days shooting this one scene that we see in uh and life goes on 
Yeah. There, there's, there's quite a bit of it set around that specifically. And then there's, there's other stuff around it where we see casting and stuff, but this guy's very actively director directing throughout the course of the movie. And uh, one of my favorite scenes, just because it's kind of like a really funny joke is, um, the, the scene where it's a really like long shot. I mean, long as in both its length, but also the distance of the lens and the characters from mm-hmm. the, uh, from, from the camera it, it, where the director from through the olive trees is directing the director from, um, and life, goes uh, on. from and life goes on, on how to be a director in the movie. And yeah. meanwhile, you also know that behind the screens, Kiristami, who's the director of all three movies is directing them as well. And this is why people call it the Coker trilogy. <laughs> Not yeah. necessarily just because it's all set in the same place, but because it's literally been stitched together through the meta narrative. So in that sense, I think I actually do have to disagree a little bit with uh, Kiristami on this not being a trilogy, even though there is a bit of a thematic dis- uh, parting because the last two were uh, weren't planned. They were generated off of the incident of the earthquake, but literally he stitched them all together in world. So they're they're basically a trilogy through yeah. the story if not through theme. Yeah, and we should kind of set up the scene that is sort of the backbone of this narrative, which is that in And Life Goes On, there's a scene where the director comes to a house and this uh, young man is bickering with, well, kind of bickering with this uh, young woman, and he asks if they're newlyweds. And then the guy tells this whole story about how they were married the day after the earthquake because they had no more, you know, family that, you know, they weren't able to get, all the blessings that they needed to, they just figured, you know, why not? We don't know when the next earthquake is going to hit kind of a thing. Um, and it's, it's a really powerful, it's one of the longer stories that we sit there and, and listen to. Um, and then, so in this one, we realized that they just hired a guy who had also been through the earth earthquake, had his own story to be in this scene with this girl that where they made up this, you know, interesting story about their, their marriage on this night and all this kind of stuff. But, Turns out that the guy had the guy who they get to act in this scene had been courting the girl that they also have acting in the scene and her family wouldn't let her marry him because he was of a different class. He was illiterate. Um, And even though they in this new, quote unquote, real world of through the olive trees, each had their own earthquake stories and had family die and stuff, they still wouldn't let them get married. So it's almost the opposite of the story that they told in and life goes on but here we have the director in through the olive trees trying to help this guy kind of more or less woo this girl and get her to kind of sort yeah. of break out of her social tradition so again it's kind of man versus society he's 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 providing IRL directing services yeah uh, this one also has well this one actually has a romance plot I, we ha- we have ha- we don't have that in any of these the other films. It's very one sided though, and I think it that's is very one sided. Really interesting because yeah, she and we don't get that's part of the conflict either. is that she won't respond to him. We kind of get a resolution. It's you have to make up your own interpretation of it, but there is sort of a resolution. There's there's like a binary choice of things that could happen, and um, that's. The, 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 based on your f- mood is <laughs> basically yeah. what you pick. Did did she did she say yes or did she say no? What was your gut reaction? Uh, my gut reaction based on how he was running was that she finally said yes. That was mine too. So yeah, the yeah. so here's the and I think this is interesting because this is a very similar type of ending. It's much it's more ambiguous, but it's similar in style to the ending of and life goes on, where we have this really. A uh, long shot again of this field and the girl is walking away and he runs and catches up with her and then he's following her for a while and then she turns for like maybe two seconds and then turns back and keeps walking and he stops and turns and bolts back towards the camera the way he came which he had left some stuff up here by the camera and so you're like is he running because it's over? Is he running because he's got to go get the stuff? Is he running, you know, to tell the director, you know, but the, the shot goes on for so long. And this is something that I kind of want to bring up that you kind of have the time to start making a lot of assumptions that 
the dir- that well, that's the director, where the powers of his, of his long not, shot. Yeah, that Kiarostami is not going to tell you, but he's going to give you the time to start making your own thoughts. So this is something that um, uh, director writer uh, Paul Schrader had kind of written about in a book um, towards the beginning of his career called Transcendentalism in Film, where he talks about um, the directors Yashiro Ozu, uh, Robert Bresson, and uh, Andrei Tarkovsky, and the way that they use cinema in similar ways, and Karostami definitely falls in line with their styles. And what they would use a lot of times is these shots that just go on for so long that either go past the action or that show a lot of actions that other movies would cut out. But uh-huh. they show so much of it that you stop watching the film and you start watching the things around the film. You start seeing the other things in frame. You start seeing, you know, small things because you have the time and you start having like your mind starts to wander around the scene kind of a thing. So if you're if you're engaged engage with the piece, yeah. Yeah. If you if you're actually watching it, if you're kind of half watching it, you might be like, well, what is happening? But if you're actually kind of engaged, your mind starts to just mull over what's going on in the film, what is uh, being presented, what is kind of behind what's being presented. And it it's kind of a different way of interacting with films. It's almost the opposite of, you know, the uh, the American action film, where we're just going to show you so much, like a Bond film, we're just going to show you so much in such quick succession that all you have time to think about is the exact surface of the pixels on the screen and not much more than that, and the actual words being said. But these films kind of ask you and almost demand that you go beyond that while you're watching it, um, which is not for everybody, but it's, it is a very particular, very introspective way of making films that Kiarostami built his whole career on. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's basically one of the most important parts about the long shot, right? Is that it gives you time to engage with the, um, with the piece Sometimes we forget, like, the the power of the edit is really strong, but it's also hypnotic in a way, mm-hmm. and it takes, it's, it's, it's very guiding. So the more cuts, the more hands-on the movie is, or the piece is, with how you engage with it. It's the more controlling it is with how, you, how it engages with you. Whereas the, the boldness of a long cut is to let you have that space to wander, to engage, to create yeah. your own interpretation and interaction. And if you're paying attention, you'll probably reach... Um, reach a very certain conclusion if somebody's played with the the long shot in a very specific way. And with somebody like Kiarostami, you normally end up reacting a very, very much, I think, the way it's intended. Um, mm-hmm. After all, the way that the final long shot of Through the Olive Trees is set up is after all this tension where we just want this girl to respond and probably yes to this poor lovesick sap of a guy. Um, yeah, who's very he's very persistent, but in in more of a sweet than an annoying kind of way. I mean, depending on how you take that kind of thing. If you consider that most of his family just died and yeah. that most of her family just died. I mean, he's maybe very not the sincere, best time, which is it's... what we get through the film. But he's also yeah. a little clumsy in his execution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, you set up all that tension and then you finally... Um, Oh gosh, you finally get this you reaction and you see this excited thing. running. You just change and, one thing. Yeah, and that's that's it. That's all it takes. And we assume we we he set it up so that we wanted one thing to happen and then we get in a, a high energy action on screen and even though we don't get the specific details, we assume that it's a positive thing at the end, mm-hmm. even though we can't say for certain whether or not it is. You know what other movie does this really well that is almost mainstream but it's a little too old to be like fully mainstream these days uh is the very last shot of the third man um does the same kind of thing where it it's a long shot you have you know exactly what you think is going to happen and then it slaps you in the face at the last second and then roll credits and it's great well it's interesting that you bring that up because i have realized after doing prep work for not this episode but an upcoming episode that one of the standbys of really good noir is a long shot and especially a long yeah. shot with a lot of camera movement. And I think Citizen Kane is mostly to blame for that. Um, <laughs> well, but, I think the one in the in the third man, it was a completely static camera for several minutes. You know the shot I'm talking about? I do know the shot you're talking about. Yes. OK. 
Yeah, that's that's a special one. But I, I did I just wanted to say that I do think that like overall, it that is a very much a film noir standby, and we will be seeing quite a bit of it in in yeah. the upcoming episode. Um, the other thing I was thinking when I watched this movie is that it does have probably because it has the inclusion of the romance uh, uh, plot, it has more of a new wave French vibe than the neo realistic vibe mm-hmm. um, from some of Kiarostami's earlier works. Uh, just because too, like it starts to talk about like philosophizing on love and stuff when this kid is talking about like his his romantic obsession with um this girl in the car with the director uh yeah. that part was very 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 french new wave with that being said let's move on to taste of cherry from 1997 taste of cherry from 1997 Mr. Body drives through the outskirts of Terran, looking for someone to perform a task for him, to find him the next morning and save him if he's still alive, or to bury him if he's gone through with his suicide. All right, so this movie is amazing. I'm just going to throw that out there. It's going to be really hard to say anything negative about it. You know what's funny is uh, I I just, like, Googled this to find, like, the Wikipedia page or something, but I found a review by Roger Ebert, and he hated this film. (laughs) It was actually really funny to to read his uh Really? Mm-hmm. That's surprising. That's surprising. Of course, you know what? I don't know much about Ebert's takes on foreign movies. Well, that's not to say like he had a he had a wide range of tastes, but basically he's he thinks that uh Karasami didn't pay off the style he was going for. Like basically he felt that the the slow pace was uh affected and it 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 didn't achieve the the goal of introspective introspection that he was going for, which is obviously debatable because plenty of people uh, have gotten a lot out of this movie. That's shocking because it is is not set up to have a goal in mind. The point right. isn't much like actually much like through the olive trees. I don't think this one has a very clear ending unless I'm exactly I'm misremembering that. Right. That's why uh, I'm saying I think Where's the Friends House is the only film that actually ends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This one doesn't really have an ending. Um, it, it it ends. It re, it ends at the point where you have all the information. Um, what, what am I trying to say? Oh, here's a good way to put it. It ends when the the uh, so so the, the construction of a good argument or the construction of a good thought argument in an introspective piece is much like the good construction of a good court case. And I'm thinking about this because I'm playing a lot of Ace Attorney right now, so <laughs> forgive me. But it's well, basically, on the other hand, it's like it's like resigning a chess match without playing it out because you know the outcome. Kind of like that, but I'm really thinking about the Socratic method here, and that's that's what I want to get to, right? Okay. So you you have you have a thesis and an antithesis, which are the two opposing points of view, and they're supposed to create the synthesis, which is a new understanding blending the two arguments together to reach a new point. And most movies that successfully present any argument at all, because not all movies even attempt it, <clears throat> Marvel, um, if they have a thesis and an antithesis, they will present you with a synthesis, right? But in in a lot of Kiarostami movies and a lot of other movies, you have, uh, you have a thesis and an antithesis that are very strongly presented and the last, the conclusion, the climax, the ending of the movie is asking you to do the work of providing the synthesis, right? So that's what we do at the end of Through the Olive Trees when it's asking you to decide, okay, you've, you've seen these two arguments, will, will she or won't she? And what do you think at the end? And at the end of Taste of Cherry, will he or won't he kill himself? What do you think at the end? And yeah. I have my my guess as to what I believe it happened at the end of Taste of Cherry. I don't think he killed himself. Um, right. Uh, but you're, but the the important part is not whether or not he did anything. Because if we present, honestly, if we presented him as not dying or dying, that would kind of ruin it because it would it would end the the uh, the thinking process in your own brain. And at mm-hmm. the, the it, you're supposed to keep thinking about it after you leave the theater and, and keep wondering about it and come back to those points about like why life is precious versus um, the more cynical antithesis that the protagonist himself is presenting throughout the uh, throughout the, uh, right. the the movie. Also coming off as one of the creepiest people in cinema. If you think about, if you really think about it from like the 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 guest's point of view, when he like brings these people into his car, he, well, that's, he, he, 
Yeah, sorry, go yeah. ahead. Uh, it, it's so it's so creepy because I knew I knew the concept of this movie right, mm-hmm. and if you went into this totally uh, without foreknowledge of it, you wouldn't understand what he's driving at until he yeah. finally gets to the grave site with the soldier. So you'd be in the same situation as the soldier is, and you'd be like, "This dude is really weird and really creepy." Um, yeah, that's so, actually but, one but, of yeah. one of Ebert's hangups is some of those things that aren't like fully satisfied like so for example that very first one it <clears throat> doesn't explicitly but it it's hard to avoid the implication that he might be trying to initiate a you know homosexual hookup with this guy yeah and, that's kind of definitely what it comes off uh, across as first but that's never like like what ebert was saying is why even let the audience think that and why, you know, what does that say something about the character? I don't think it does because it's the character, the fact that we don't learn anything about the character kind of points again to what is the actual importance. It's not about this man in particular. It's about why yeah. is life itself worth preserving in anyone. Um, but there are some of those things that's just like, why would you even bring that up as a thought at the beginning if it has no implication on the rest of the film? Um, but yeah, yeah it's well, just, I, I think it's also I think hard part to of it br- make that too. request to anybody. So it's probably the most natural course of action. And, and the, I think part of it too, for us, uh, is that we might be coming, it might be a, uh, a, a cultural assumption where that might just never Possibly. cross. Yeah. Like in, in Iran, that might literally be so out of the pale of assumptions that you might make about another person that you would never, ever assume that that, that is what's going yeah. on there. Although that first um, guy looks really nervous and very yeah. uncomfortable. He does. He does. Uh, he, he accepted a ride and then the guy's suddenly like, we're going to go somewhere else. And one of the things that I think about is that the guy might just be worried that he's going to murder him or something yeah. like that too. That, uh, that was after the all, he does drive Taylor to a grave site. Get over right? when we were watching it. Cause I was like, I, I would probably usually assume that, but I know Kiarostami, and I know that's not what this is. But yeah. any any other director making this film, I would be like, he's just going to shoot someone and throw them in the hole. Like this is what this movie's about, right? And and I do I do think that um, there is a point to not providing that clarity at first because yeah. it is sort of the the con- the the uh, the the concept that this guy's come up with to kill himself is very contrived. Um, and, uh, very elaborate and very crazy. So the, the way that he's, he's done is kind of an extreme. And I think both for, uh, the filmmaker and the audience, it took a moment to kind of ease into that idea, not to just, uh, hit you with it up front. Although that could be another strategy to just hit you with it right away and then move on from there. But it kind of eases you into it through, and it very purposely takes you through those moments of uncomfortability um, until uh, until you get there. The other experience you might have during that opening segment with the soldier is uh, kind of like that, that feeling that you get when your life is in danger, where your life starts to flash before your eyes, mm-hmm. and you start to look back towards other experiences to see if there's anything you can do to survive. And that kind of retrospective, individualistic uh, look back on your life, I think is something important to bring to this movie because like you said, the uh, protagonist himself, we don't, we don't learn why he wants to kill himself. We never learn that. We right. never learn anything about his life. Although he does seem to be like, you know, fairly well off. He doesn't seem terribly poor. He doesn't seem to have connections to anybody else that we see. He doesn't but seem than- sickly or, but again, I think, I think part of it is like I said, that he's kind of a, a blank slate. He can represent yeah, he, you're anybody. You're supposed to, you're supposed to kind of be projecting yourself onto him throughout the course of the movie. Yeah. Um, and I think certainly for anybody who's struggled with depression or suicidal thoughts, you certainly will. Uh, and I mm-hmm. think it's very obvious through multiple uh, instances of Kurostami's movies, including his first feature that we mentioned in his bio section on this podcast. Um and of course, this is kind of a big assumption, but I would be very surprised if he never had suicidal thoughts. Right. I don't know if there's any 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 accounting of it out there about him think, where he's ever spoken about it, but I'd be very shocked if that wasn't the case. Uh, another review that I saw kind of made the case that in 
I think I think this is actually a true anecdote that in the shots where we're just seeing um, the protagonist in the driver's seat, uh, Kiarostami was in the passenger seat in all of those scenes to provide the the extra dialogue and extra eyesight. So it's kind of like, yeah, you can sort of make that assumption that Kiarostami has been in that seat before. You know, he's been through. And again, going back to the whole, if if we are also assuming that Kiarostami makes his films in a sense, in order to work through his own conflicting thoughts and emotions on various, you know, topics and interactions and people and stuff like that, it it makes a lot of sense that he's making this film from a very personal place. Yes, I think so too. I think so too. And I also think that they, um, they again, through the long shot, and, and what we talked about before with his long shot and that inclusion of dialogue in spaces of looking where um, where you normally wouldn't have in a long shot, you get that active engagement and introspection. And you find yourself watching this movie very actively and very closely, even though almost nothing happens in it. Yeah. Um, and you catch very small details that I don't think you otherwise would catch. And part of that, one of the... The thing that I noticed throughout it was that this guy, this guy wants someone to tell him not to kill himself. Kind of, but he also he, that, that's does part he, of it within him. He doesn't want the the standard because he says that he does. He doesn't want a sermon. He doesn't want anyone to try and talk him out of it. Yeah. But yet the, the method that he's come up with, which is to take sleeping pills and for the person to either help him out if he hasn't died or to bury him if he has died like his method is essentially leaving it to fate. He's saying, I'm going to take all my yeah. sleeping pills. Maybe I'll survive. Maybe I won't. He's giving him himself a chance. Like if yeah. he wanted to for sure kill himself, he would have chosen a different. There's way. more sure method you could choose. Um, and he's so it's so elaborate, too, that there's so many chances of failure. I So here's what it boils down to. This guy doesn't really want to die but he needs someone to give him a reason to live Mm -hmm. and at the end i think the reason is that being alive in and of itself is a reason to live Uh, at least that's what i came away with it's also about help Um, you know this this is a theme that comes up a lot which is a he's asking for someone to help him you know accomplish what he has set his mind to Um, But also, like the taxidermist says, I think man should help other men, but it should be a different way than this. Um, And but there's also a lot of a lot more subtle ways that that happens. Like after the soldier runs away and he's driving back down the hill and his car gets stuck and all these workers who don't know him and that, you know, are doing their job, drop everything that they're doing. And like 20 of them surround his car and help him lift it up out of the ditch and uh, get back on track. And this is mm-hmm. before he's gone through any of his philosophizing, but it's this, it's it's one of those things that I think Kiarostami is building where he's finding those reasons to live all around him. Um, and I love the way that the, uh, the taxidermist do, does this. He basically does it, he uses a lot of dialogue and he uses his empathy, but he also uses taking the longer route, taking the more beautiful route, the more scenic route. And he builds Mm -hmm. that into both his narrative and the physical aspect of their, of their journey. And by making him, you know, take a, take a different way, take a way where you see more of the world than just directly from point A to point B where you don't see any other way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I also like that he's, if you just look at his actions, you can see that he's he's not really uh, he's not completely distanced himself from the idea of life, right? And he mm-hmm. is looking for that help, like you said. So mm-hmm. I, there's one line that sticks out to me that's very small, where someone offers him eggs and he says, "But eggs are bad for me." Yeah, and I'm like, well, if you if you, dude, if you were going to kill yourself, we, right. you wouldn't care. Right. Um, or or just the idea that in the the opening segments where we see him looking through all the day laborers and they're all asking him like, how many do you want? They're assuming for a construction job. He could easily, easily have picked one of them 
and it would be over. It would be done. They would just do it. And, they, and he they brings that up else. too. He says, if I wanted a grave digger, I'd have hired a, gra- I'd have asked a grave digger. digger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But he does, he, yeah, he wants that, that friction of, of people who know that what he's doing is wrong. Cause he knows it too, you know, deep down. That's kind of the thing is he knows that this is not the right way. But he's he's looking for someone else who knows it intrinsically to yeah. be able to articulate it. And that's what he's, the, the taxiderm is bringing the empathy to it is is kind of what helps, because yeah. he even tells the um, the seminarian, you know, you you can understand me, but you can't feel my pain. But the taxidermist feels his pain because he's been in the exact same spot. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like I like the the kind of like almost folktale setup too that you have the soldier, mm-hmm. the priest, and then um, I, I've called him the grave digger. But there's also that line where he said he wasn't looking for a grave digger for the taxidermist. I'm trying to think of a more like fairy tale way of doing that, like the grave keeper or the uh, mortician, the preservationist. I mean, that's the preservationist. What he is. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking. He's he he pre- he preserves what is dead, and that's kind yeah. of what he's done with the the soul of this man who's kind of emotionally dead but he's giving it you know new life if we're going to get really <laughs> metaphysical with it yes but yeah. the fact that you bring it up as a fairy tale is interesting because it's also kind of has echoes with um other things like almost the book of job where you have job who's being tormented and each of his friends comes giving him a different perspective that's each skewed just a little bit um and that kind of thing so that it is kind of along those lines exactly and it's one of the things that i like i one of, so kind of along those lines one of the things that i i like about this movie and i think makes it so easy for it to stick with you is kind of that function as like a parable as a very simple fairy tale mm-hmm. with so much space to paint your own experience onto it so that it it doesn't it exists within a different cultural context but it exists so much within a universal context that it doesn't it, it, it applies to everybody basically, right? Like right. Um, there is, there is nothing about this character that could remove him really truly from anyone else in the world, um, which is, is quite impressive. And even just keeping the, the shots as simple and the focus so much on our main character, like think about the fact that most of this movie is one medium shot of this guy driving. Right. Sure. In different locations, but basically the same shot of this guy driving in, in, oh. in his seat. There's, okay, so that's true, but but where it differs from that is is interesting. So I just remembered the one, the one piece of this film that gives it, again, kind of that dreamlike, almost transcendent, I mean, there's, there are several points, but there's one moment where when we talk about films like this, it happens with Tarkovsky too, but you... You know, sometimes you're like, am I kind of (laughs) this film almost feels like a dream. And there's this one moment before we meet the taxidermist because we don't ever meet the taxidermist. Do you remember how this happens? Mm. He's he's standing in the uh, in the construction site. He's looking at all the the work being done, the rocks being poured. We're seeing his shadow being being, distorted, buried. I love that. scene, by the way, where he's being buried before he's being buried. He's mm -hmm. like. Thought, thought exercising it. Yeah, uh, he's, is, is the he shadow of himself is being... But then you have the guy who comes and yells at him and is like, hey, move your car. Move your car, man. Are you asleep? Come on, move, move your car. You're blocking the road. You're blocking the road. Do you need help? Do you need something? Are you okay? You're blocking mm-hmm. the road. Move your car. And then we cut. And all of a sudden, we're back in the car and the taxidermist is talking. But we don't see him for like a solid minute while he monologues. And yeah. you're just like, Wait, where did this guy come from? We see him pick up all the other guys, but the taxidermist almost shows up like a ghost and is just like there and he's talking to him and he's the one that, again, it's left open-ended, but by the end of his talk with the taxidermist, he's almost desperate for the taxidermist to find him alive. He like is like running back to him, like, please make sure that I'm not dead because I might still be alive. And that's probably why you're thinking that he's he didn't go through with his plan. That makes sense. That so. makes sense. Yeah, dang. I mean, yeah, it's just good. It's really good. Yeah. It's full of very uh, very memorable visual styles. I love the color palette of this movie. Um, it's gorgeous. set. Well, it's interesting because in the previous <laughs> movies, right, 
I would say that Where's the Friend's House has a distinct color palette in the sense that it's rooted in its location. Mm-hmm. Um, very and then, muted. And, and Life Goes On has a very transitory developing color palette. It starts off very kind of like brown and kind of like the slate gray rock. And then kind of slowly morphs it greener and greener as the main character's focus shifts more towards life. And through the olive trees, it's just swamped in green. It has a very yeah. vibrant, very alive feel. Taste of Cherry is set among this red, brown, Orange. dusty idea of Earth, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's the, the color palette itself screams ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It, it, it's Oh, they say about, that too. When when he Did goes it? to the security guard and uh, and he's like, hey, you've got a nice hut, and the guy's like, it's just dirt, and and he says, all good things come from the earth, right? And then things, they have this dialogue, the earth, and then he says, so you're saying all good things return to the earth, and they ha- they have this dialogue that the security guard is probably, you know, thinks is nothing, but it has such another level when you know what the main character is thinking. I mean, when you think about it, like a taste of cherry, all that is is some nutrients from the soil mixed with some water. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. it. That's all it is. That's all we are. We're just we're just earth molded into humans. That's it. There's dirt and water. We're just dirt. Yeah. Let's slide on into overall notes and talk about this idea of um well, lots about Kurostami, but I do want to talk about like this line he walks with his meta narratives where mm-hmm. he's partially He's dancing between like a narrative and like a documentary narrative in some of these movies very directly. We can even bring so. close up into this because that's the first film we covered of his back in the world. Back in the world, it's War. very relevant to that subject, it's right? The same thing. It's, it's basically a documentary, but it's 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 more of a narrative, and it kind of it's a you know what it kind of points at of is the a recreation. Yes. It, it, you know what it kind of points to is the idea that the line between narrative and documentary is not as firm so, as we would think it is. It's really yeah. not because they're both narratively driven, right? It's just that somebody, in one instance, somebody's prepared the scenes, and in the other instance, someone hasn't prepared the scenes, except normally you have prepared the scenes because you've put thought into how you're going to capture it, what you're going to capture, yeah. what you're going to show. All of the constructural trappings of narrative still exist within a documentary. The least documentary thing possible is literally just to like sit and look at something. <laughs> or the least narrative thing possible is just to sit and look at something. Right. right? But still, things happen in a sequence, which is what a narrative is. Which is why when I was in... Uh, Narratives are inescapable. My, my, yeah, my first film class, when talking about uh, narrative and documentary films, my teacher made everyone confused because she was like, well, documentaries are still narratives because you know things happen in a sequence and you're still building a story. I'm like, okay, but can we just call them narrative and documentary? But the point is, like, there there is that line. Like, all... Like, we wouldn't be watching it if it wasn't a sequence of things happening, which is what narrative essentially is and the fact that it's packaged and presented makes it a narrative rather than just staring out your window yes exactly although even if you stare out your window and you see a bird land on a branch and take a poop and fly off like that's a beginning middle and end that's a narrative yeah and most of them are more involved than that but even in nature you know you've got the squirrel trying to get his nut up the tree but it's too big and he falls down and then he you know he makes it work and you know that's your story Life is but squirrels and nuts, man. That's all it is. <laughs> I think anyway. Shakespeare wrote that. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm quoting Henry V. Um, yeah, but all I, all that is to say that he does play with the idea of the meta narrative. It's very bold of him to keep setting the next movie as a behind the scenes of the previous movie, um, or like essentially mm-hmm. a special feature of the previous movie. But it does lead to some interesting uh, interesting involvement. And to that end, I am going to have to make at least my official stance is that I disagree with Kiristami about the um, uh, about the trilogies in that I think the Coker yeah. trilogy is a good thing because he literally connected them. Yeah, I think thematically it makes more sense to link the last two with Taste of Cherry, but he 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 actively he MCU'd his first three movies together. Yeah, uh, or the first three movies we're speaking about right now. They're not his the first three movies overall. But he, he, he stuck those guys together. He connected them in universe. They exist as a trilogy. Maybe not thematically, but they do exist as a trilogy. Yeah. And even the fact that he, like I said, he he reused that winding road shot 
in all three of the films. There's yeah, there's like, repeating characters you don't do and motifs. That if you're not thinking about them as a unit. Again, in a car. Actually, speaking of which, we should talk about the fact that Kiarostami spends so much time in cars. It's like what he's known for. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it really among- boils it boils it down to what he's after, which is the the relationship between people and people to their environment. Because when you're in a car, you're talking to the person next to you and you're looking at your environment out the window. And that's really the two things that Kiarostami is most interested in in all of these films. Yeah, very much so. And I think he realizes the significance of, uh, well, one, in in a car, we should say that you experience the art of watching like no other, almost in a meditative sense, right? Mm Because in a car, you do nothing but look out the window. It's a matter of life and death when you're in a car. And I think Kiarostami understands that uh, that that's you're what looking stories out are a too. Screen, very much like a camera does. Yeah, but if you don't pay attention, you're going to drive off a cliff. <laughs> yep, yep, that's not good. Um, but two, you 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 do almost basically a lot of meditative thinking in the car, especially when you're not listening to the radio or something. Mm-hmm. You do you do a lot of that introspection. A lot of deep conversations happen in cars. I don't know what it is, but I have experienced that before. People just like let down their guard in a car in a way that they don't in other situations. It's mm-hmm. like being in a car gives you permission to talk about like things that you wouldn't normally speak about. It's really weird how that happens, but there is that sort of magic there, and and Kiarostami does capture that and is seems to be fascinated by it in a sense. Yeah. I mean, I can't think of a single movie where there isn't a long conversation around transportation i guess where's the friend's house but he's walking and there's that entire segment where he's walking with the old man for like nine minutes straight i honestly watched a certified copy because i was hoping to watch a kurosami film that was more traditionally narrative and not a conversation in a car and uh it wasn't so (laughs) it was the same thing just in italy yep so yeah the, the other thing that we've kind of been bringing into this conversation is the uh, the use of long shots, again, just building films that make you think about them in a way that films that we're more used to in America don't usually do. Um, and also leaving open ends to kind of reframe the film. Like, again, when when and life goes on ends, you realize it's not really about those two boys. It's about everyone else who's been impacted. Um, and when. A taste of cherry ends you realize it's not necessarily about whether or not this guy kills himself but it's about whether or not life is worth living you know by not answering the questions he reframes what you thought the film was about for the first you know 90 minutes to two hours yeah no it's um i mean kier's tommy movies are all about theme right mm-hmm. theme and introspection so that's all that's it, left is, when you take out the action yeah Right. Because there isn't much plot. <laughs> yeah. There just isn't. There's some. There's as much as is necessary, but that just isn't the focus. Um, I will say as much as I like a big action plot. I do like a good story, too, and I do like a good bit of thinking and introspection. So it's nice to come to these movies from time to time. Yeah. I keep wondering what an experience of watching one of these movies for the very first time in a movie theater would be like, because it's so foreign to our understanding of a film going experience right it's definitely not like a popcorn movie right right because you would hear all the popcorn there are no moments that would that would hide it you can't even wait for the dinosaurs to pop out of the bushes to to do your crunchy unwrapping of your candy i guess that's yeah right yeah open up those butterfingers real slow um the uh i guess that's a another question that we don't necessarily know uh, a lot of the times when we look at foreign cinema, we look at the stuff that's been very successful internationally, which tends to be very, for lack of a better term, art housey, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't know if like Kiarostami, because I haven't looked it up, but it would be interesting to see how popular his movies were with the Iranian public. Obviously, they were able to make enough money to keep his career alive, and he had enough mm-hmm. international recognition to uh, keep his career alive for a very for his whole life. But, uh, you know, is is uh, the type of film that Kiarostami makes the most popular thing in theory in theaters in um, in, in Iran at the time? Or do they have their version of a blockbuster um, that exists alongside this that people go see depending on their tastes? Right. 
You yeah, know, it's I like think it's interesting we, that all the all the Iranian films that we have picked, like when we did uh, the world tour, they all kind of fit the same tone. That was very introspective. Again, not much of bad guys, but just sort of moral conflicts and social conflicts. Um, but again, we we've picked a small selection of Iranian films, but the trend from those is is very much in the same kind of direction. Yeah, we tend to find international films most often often through like stuff like Criterion, right? Mm-hmm. So that's going to skew the kinds of movies that we see internationally. So sometimes it can be easy to make the assumption that all people watch internationally or in other other countries are Criterion films, when that's normally not the case. Um, I, I mean, like the best example I can think of is like look at um, look at India, and, and you know you have all the big budget blockbuster Bollywood, Tollywood. Uh, Hollywood, all those things that we talked about. Um, but you also have like the Sajit, oh, what's his last name? Sajit Dry. Sajit Dry. Um, you also have his movies who existed at the same time as, as Bollywood was getting popular. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have both in the same, in the same vein, much like you do in America where you have big blockbusters and you have art house movies being made at the same time. Um, so, you know, I love Kirstami, but also it can be easy to substitute him in yeah. as, a, as a foreigner for all of Iranian cinema when that's normally not the case. And it's also hard to tell when a country's film industry is, you know, it's got to be fractionally smaller than like uh, uh, American cinema or even India, like India's film production mechanism is probably rivals the Americas in size, if not bigger. Um, but Iran's is very it's definitely different. bigger at this point. So like in the, terms of like how much they produce, it's gotta be bigger. Right. But but what I'm saying is Iran's the the size of their film industry probably also limits the variety of films that are made. So it's interesting that the ones that we have found are all kind of in this almost anti Bollywood style of uh filmmaking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's um yeah, it's an interesting dichotomy. Mm-hmm. I mean, we definitely, uh, obviously, here on the the film links, we love us uh, some art house stuff, right? So oh, yeah. we're going to feature a lot of that. I did find we'll- that uh, Where's the Friend's House is cited as one of uh, um, Kurosawa's favorite films. So there you go. That makes sense. I can totally see that. I mean, if you if you want like a masterclass in subjective camera placement, it's perfect, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, if you want to see just like, so let's say the question... Because one of the basic questions you have to answer when you set up a shot list and shoot a scene is who is our viewpoint character? Are we going to have a viewpoint character, right? Um, or I'd say it's probably impossible to have a scene where there isn't a viewpoint character unless there's literally no humans um, or even animals. But you're, you've got to pick who you're going to feature, who's going to be this close up. This is the March of the Penguins. Sorry. Yeah. Well, even then you have the penguins. They're... they're <laughs> The viewpoint the of the penguins is starvation and cold. Yes. Yep. Basically, but you got you got to pick it out. And and uh, I mean, it's you know, where's the friend's house is probably a very extreme example of like taking that that uh, that idea that technique and blowing it up to the size of a whole movie. But uh, it is a masterclass in that. So if you're struggling with that, or if you want to learn about that, then where's the friend's house? Go watch that, and you'll understand a lot better how to use your camera subjectively in a scene and how to generate sympathy uh, for a character, how to make certain actions in a scene appear different based on who's viewing those actions and from what angle. Yep. And, and all the other, like the, the other two of the Coker trilogy um, kind of beyond a character level kind of draw you in on an artistic level and make you think about the implications of how you portray uh, people in the face of disaster or in the face of their own, you know, personal conflicts and stuff like that. How do you approach them? How do you, uh, you know, treat them with sensitivity, but also don't like without completely distancing yourself from, from their hurt and just like being more than an onlooker, but also being active in, in their struggles. Um, and it's, it's again, things that he's contemplating. It doesn't give, solid answers for but watching them makes you think about them on a deeper level because if there's anything karostami can do it's bring things to another level 
Yeah, exactly. I guess if there's one other thing, like if we're if we're in the business of handing out tips to um, to people looking to make movies, the best thing we could probably tell you is go like people watch. Yeah. <laughs> like go go watch a lot of people. Just listen to go, the way they talk and the way that they, you know, yeah. what their uh you know, what their needs are at any given moment. Cuz that's the other thing. Like the building blocks of a scene is a character wants something and the ways that the other characters or the situation prevent or help them in doing that. So like in and life goes on, you have the scene of the woman whose rug is buried under the rubble and she's trying to pull it out. She's like this 80 year old woman and the director comes up to her and he's like, well, you, you can't get that rug out. It's, there's there's too much rubble on it. It's too stuck. Uh, I'd help you, but I have a bad back. Like this dude is so healthy <laughs> and uh, he's like, I got a bad back, so I can't help you. It's it, it's too stuck. But here I can I can carry your lamp and clean it off or whatever he says. And then mm -hmm. a f like a few shots later, we see this lady walking out of her house with her rug and start dusting it off. And you're like, she had a goal and she accomplished it with or without this guy's help because he wasn't actually interested in helping her. Yeah, exactly. So it's just gotta watch. You have to imagine that Karostami had been through Seen this town. Like I mean, that, that might have yeah. actually been happening and he framed the scene around it, but you know, he may have even helped her get the rug out in between shots, but he's watching, he's seeing the struggles, even the little struggles. Like you have the big struggle of the earthquake, but you have the little struggles of people trying to find their lamp, trying yeah, to wash their clothes, life. trying to get their rugs out, um, along with trying to reconnect with their family who's passed away and all that kind of stuff. Like all every level of those things, Karostami is paying attention to, even if the character of him in the film isn't. Yeah. It's all about watching story. Stories aren't hard if you aren't hard to find if you look. They're yeah. all around you. You just have to pay attention. And if anything, that's really the I think the biggest lesson we could learn from Kiristami. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Jonathan. Anything else to say before we wrap out this episode? I don't think so. I think we've I think we've covered Kiristami. Yeah, um, I think we got I think we got pretty uh pretty deep into his noggin there. Yeah. But we do have to prep the episode for next month, Jonathan. And what is that going to be? Yeah, I, a uh, very different type of director, different in sensibility and uh, execution. Lots of long takes, though. Yeah, lots of long takes. Uh, so we're going to talk about Otto Preminger. Um, and we have, we have touched on Preminger a little bit because we've talked about uh, some of his contemporaries. We saw him in Stalag 17 at the end of last season. Um, and yeah, he did some acting, he did directing, he was a big presence, a commanding and intimidating presence, um, which is why he would often play Nazis and bad guys on screen. And uh, some would say he acted very similarly off screen. So yeah, he had quite the, uh, quite the almost just unhinged uh, off screen persona yeah. that he cultivated for himself. Which How is very fascinating. Is, is in something the, we'll dive into next time. Right especially given the the types of films that he made, which were very kind of cutting edge and very intense type of films. So the ones that we're talking about are going to be Laura from 1944, classic of the film noir genre, uh, Bonjour Tristesse from 1958, Anatomy of a Murder from 1959, and Bunny Lake is Missing from 1965, which has uh, Laurence Olivier in it to also it tie does. back to it a does. recent episode. One of his uh, more empathetic roles, I will say. But if you would like to support the podcast, you can get more info on our Patreon. Anyone can join the Discord and join our film conversation. If you subscribe on Patreon, you can listen to us record live, and you can also get access to the bonus podcast. The last thing we talked about was... We talked about Lot Renninger and her early pre-Disney animation style of uh, silhouetted cutouts and stop motion and it's really fascinating very unique almost Tim Burkean style so you can hear all about that that was uh she was making films a hundred years ago which is some of the kind of stuff that we talk about over there so more info on the Patreon if you're interested mm -hmm. yeah check that out that's about all the time we have for this episode to find links to things that we talked about today as well as a complete list of past episodes and all 429 films we've covered so far visit thefilmlinks.com 
And you can also join us for ongoing film discussions on our Discord server. And to stay posted about upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter at The Filmlings. Summaries for each of the films this episode were recorded by me, Jason Harden. You can find me on Twitter at the Blue Jay 1994 If you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review on iTunes so other people will know what we're all about. We definitely appreciate it. Talk to you next time. All right, see ya. You ever you ever stop and think about what like your atoms used to be part of? <laughs> this, that's the kind of introspection that this movie prompts. Yeah. You right. ever like wonder like, huh? I wonder if some atoms in my like shin bone <laughs> used to be in a dinosaur. That would be really cool. <laughs> you ever think about that? Oh my god! Is that gosh. just me? Your shin bone has predatory instincts, Alex. Well, it does. It does sometimes declare I'm the king of the lizards, and that worries me. <laughs>